Norm Chomsky is here. He is a political activist. He is a writer and is a professor at MIT. He has written exclusively and lectured around the world on linguistics, philosophy, and politics. He is widely credited with having revolutionized modern linguistics. He is the author of numerous books, including American Power and the New Mandarins, and also 9-11. Here is Hegemony or Survival, his newest book. I am pleased to have him on this program for many reasons, including the fact that I get more emails about please have Mr. Chomsky <laughs> on this program than anyone can ever imagine. Mm -hmm. um, how do you explain this phenomenal connection between you and certainly an audience of people who are user-friendly with the Internet? It well, I think uh, people who are, there's an enormous number of people who are involved in a informal, disorganized, uh, activist, dissident culture and they tend to make their own connections outside the major institutional channels which right. are not, not hospitable to them and the internet has been uh, has become a major form of uh, interconnection organizing uh, uh, not just in the united states uh, sure. everywhere i mean in south korea for example they recently uh, elected a president uh, using the internet for organizing and communication and getting around the strong opposition of the media and the concentrated mm -hmm. power to the popular candidates. Well, it happens we, to be a very wired up society. Well, it is. Broadband, uh, I think, has a higher yeah. penetration in South Korea, yeah. perhaps more than any other country except Singapore. But it's happened every, I mean, let's take, say, Indonesia. Yeah. When the Suharto dictatorship was overthrown in 1998, uh, a lot of the organizing, a lot of it was student activism, and they it was a very harsh, brutal society, but they did succeed through internet interconnections to uh, organize political actions, demonstrations, uh, uh, other activities, and it was a major factor leading to, leading to the overthrow of the dictatorship. Well, Howard Dean, I suspect, would say that one of the primary reasons he had been able to get to this commanding position in the democratic race for the presidency is, is the internet, allowing him both to communicate and to raise money. Yeah. It's had, I mean, it's a sort of a, can also be a lethal instrument, but... Uh, lethal in what way? Well, I'm sure you get, I don't, don't want to guess how many emails you get, but <laughs> no, you it can don't. be, yeah, it can be uh, <laughs> overwhelming. <laughs> Even a lot of the material that, uh, that, one of the problems with the internet, I mean, it's, it's, the good part of it is it's free and open. Right, exactly. But, of course, that has a downside. That means that things go up that uh, have no... Uh, review and they, or uh, you know support and, you they clog the, and they clog the system. They clog the system, and yeah. so it's a mixture. But it's it certainly has been an extremely effective way of uh, allowing people to participate uh, actively in in even in in everything from industrial societies to very repressive societies. Uh, so take say the World Social Forum, which is a huge uh, enterprise, hundred hundred thousand people last year. It's mostly internet organized. There's just no other means yeah. of, inter of intercommunication among highly diverse people. Most of them are somewhat, you know, out of the power centers in their own societies, and this provides yeah. them a means of uh, organizing, exchanging information, uh, interaction that gives them access to a far wider range of uh, uh, sources of information and analysis than they would get by, you know, picking up the newspapers mm -hmm. at the newsstand, and that has major effect. Do you think regimes around the world ought to be frightened of the possibilities of the Internet? I'm sure they are, including our own government. Uh, since the uh, the Internet was, like most modern technology, it came out of the state system. Right. We have a very, a lot of the economy relies on a dynamic state sector. The Internet was right. developed... Uh, In the Pentagon or somewhere. Well, it was... Yeah, actually, places like MIT, right. but it came, yes, came out of Pentagon funding and uh, adv the Advanced Research Project Agency, the Pentagon, about in the early 60s. Right. And it remained inside the state system until a, the mid-90s. I think 1995, it was privatized. And since then, it's changed. I mean, it, 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 before that, it was considered, it, in fact, it was called usually an information highway. Uh, after that, it's mm -hmm. mostly called uh, e-commerce, right. uh, and the character of it changed. But there has been a lot of concern in power centers all over the world that it's just too free and open. And the question is, how can you shape it and modify it so as to lead people in preferred directions, you know, away from 
say, organizing the World no, Social what, Forum. For, and, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But what, for example, are the Chinese doing about it? Do you know? In China, I think Internet access is quite restricted. That's what I thought. And highly censored. Hmm. Uh, I don't know how much even limited access there is, but it's a very hard medium to control. Exactly. You know, once people have access, they can do all sorts of things. So the the means of controlling it I, that are being considered, as far as I understand, uh, are mostly uh, trying to lead people in particular directions. So that you, when you yeah. enter an internet portal, you know you'll be sort yeah. of drawn right, off right, this right, way, drawn here rather right, that there. way, okay. yeah. right, rather and therefore you'll have the rather than opening up, it'll yeah. take you somewhere. And the the idea is you'll have to use you know energy and initiative and commitment and what you're looking for if you want to go in the in the directions less preferred by power centers, which is it's mm -hmm. a terrain of struggle right now. There's a lot of pressure from popular and activist mm -hmm. groups to make it, leave it entirely open, not controlled. If you were, if this would be your last day on Earth. <laughs> <laughs> not that far from it. Well, you're, what, 75? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, would, would, your, would you like what's said about you to be your political arguments or your contribution to the theory of linguistics? Tell you the honest truth, I really don't care. You don't care. I mean, I'd like to see people follow up on the things that are interesting and important and productive, and forget about the things that were byways and mistakes and so on. But if I my name is attached to it or not, but what, uh, what then would you characterize as most important in your judgment, if you are? Well, I mean, I played a certain role in reshaping the uh, fields concerned with uh, human intellectual faculties, cognitive sciences right. in particular, linguistics. Some of it has been extremely productive. Not me, it's cooperative enterprise. And that's often running on its own. Right. Uh, in the political domain, I'm, you know, I, I would like to see people energized, participating, thinking for themselves, uh, not subordinating themselves to systems of discipline and propaganda, either in the structure of life, and there's plenty of that, or in the uh, uh, doctrinal domains. So if people can be, can come to use the capacities that they in fact have and the opportunities they in fact have to overcome systems of authority, illegitimate authority, domination, hierarchy, free themselves, uh, 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 think through issues for themselves, not the way they're taught to conform and do something about it. That's the best legacy I can imagine. Yeah. As I said to you when you said that, I know nothing about linguistics. Many, one of many subjects I know nothing about, <laughs> but especially linguistics. If there, is there one question in the air in that whole realm, though, that you would like most to know the answer to? Well, I. Like everyone, I have my own personal quirks. You know, and yes, there are some questions which some are... big mega questions? There are mega questions which uh, are on the border of research. You can't really... They're a little beyond what you can study very much. You can pick, pick away at them. But uh, well, one kind of question, which is a sort of a personal obsession, uh, is that uh, if you look at any biolo uh, language as a biological system, right. it's part of our, it's like our immune system right. or visual system, just something humans have. It's highly specific to humans. There don't seem to be any counterparts elsewhere in nature. You're, you're in New York because yeah. of our mutual friend Edward Said, who passed away uh, several a month or so ago, correct? Yeah, and you tell me what, you, tell me just because you're here, your sense of. What would you most want to say in appreciation of him? Well, Edward was an old friend. We were very close friends for years. We um, had a lot of mutual interests. Uh, uh, we've... Uh, would that be culture, music, politics? Culture, politics mainly, mainly political interests, mm. uh, including his prime concern, also a major concern of mine, Middle East, but right. much broader questions of... Uh, justice, uh, freedom, mm. uh, oppression, uh, which he was much involved in, me too, and our paths often crossed. And then it was just a close personal friendship. Actually, he had arranged, uh, we've never talked about this much, but back in the uh, 
I guess it must have been around 20 years ago or 25 years ago, he began arranging with uh, meetings between uh, high officials in the Palestine Liberation Organization when they were visiting New York, uh, meetings with uh, friends of his who were uh, sympathetic to the Palestinians, critical of the PLO, to see if there could be some constructive discussion to suggest ways in which they could change what they're doing to achieve results which would make more sense for the people involved. And I was involved in some of those meetings. Anything come out of it? No. I have to say no. Oh, what do you think of the Geneva Accord that they've been working Current on? Current Geneva Accord. Yes, exactly. Well, it offers uh, Better than some they real have. hope. Yeah. It's, it's a great improvement over the uh, uh, Camp David proposals, which were completely unacceptable. Back to the in, Palestinians? Yeah, they made no sense. You know, I mean, Jimmy Carter could, said that today uh, you? on a recent appearance on this program. Oh, really? Well, he's quite right. And as soon as you look at a map of what was proposed, you see that it was absolutely unacceptable. I mean, it broke up the, uh, and there's a lot of talk about percentages and so on, that didn't mean a thing. If you looked at the actual maps that were discussed, which unfortunately were not easily available in the United States, they should have been, but they weren't. Uh, as soon as you look at the maps, you see that what an effect it did was break the uh, West Bank into three pretty separate cantons. So these were not uh, contiguous territories? Well, they were technically contiguous, but only way around the edges. If you wanted to go from uh, you know, Bethlehem to Ramallah, you were going to have to go way to the east. And uh, the, So there were th three effectively separated territories, uh, all, again, effectively separated from a little part of East Jerusalem, which is the center of, traditional center of uh, Palestinian uh, cultural uh, educational, commercial existence. Uh, and it was a kind of a Bantustan situation, as was discussed in Israel at the time. And that, and of course, it was all separated from Gaza. Well, you know, that's uh, actually the meaning of that was described by uh, uh, Barack, pre President Barack's right. chief negotiator, Shlomo Ben-Ami. Right. And well, later, he, he, foreign he, minister. Yeah, and uh, he was the negotiator at Camp David, right. and he, uh, had, he was an academic, and shortly before he entered the government, he wrote a book about it in Hebrew in which he said the goal of the whole Oslo process then leading to this uh, would be what he called a permanent neo-colonial dependency. The Palestinians would be a neo-colonial, effectively modern colonial dependency uh, permanently. And in fact, that's what the proposal was, uh, and it couldn't work. However, after the Camp David proposals broke down, this is now September 2000, August, September 2000, that's when the current intifada started, but negotiations continued. And they uh, made some progress. Uh, in s January 2001, there were meetings in Taba, which led to uh, informal meetings, but with fairly high sure. level right. people on both right. sides. And they made considerable progress towards a more acceptable two-state settlement. But it was too late then because the Israelis were into their election. They were into the election campaign, and uh, uh, the Prime Minister Barak canceled the meetings. And uh, after Sharon was elected and the violence began to escalate, they were never picked up. Everyone assumed, I assumed too, that they were never continued. However, it turns out now we have learned that contacts did continue. And the Geneva Accords that you mention are the results of these continuing contacts. And they are, uh, they make considerable progress beyond the Taba. Hmm. The Geneva Accords hammered out by Yoshi Bellin and other Israelis in, con in over two years with, with some Palestinians, Palestinians who, who I'm not sure in part may have been part of, may have been members of the Palestinian Authority or not. I don't know. They, they some they. had been, but all are close to it. Yeah. I mean, they're as close to the center of Palestinian, uh, Palestinian don't have a state, so you they have an informal authority. But they were as close to the uh, central part of it as the Israeli negotiators were to the Israeli government. In fact, probably closer. You know? Your friend, the late Edward Said, didn't have much to say good about Yasser Arafat. No. Nor did I. Nor do you. Yeah. In fact, we were very much in accord about this for a long time. Some of but it a real disservice to the Palestinians. Well, it's a... Um, I don't think one can say that exactly. Why is that? 
because he, he's also a symbol. With, without him as a I'm asking, symbol of Palestinian... I'm not Palestinian, making a statement, I'm asking. Yeah. So we, Look, he remained a symbol of Palestinian nationality, struggle, refusal to submit. Right. Uh, that's important. Right. I mean, whatever you may think of him personally, just serving the role of enabling people to resist harsh oppression, uh, probable destruction, which was the goal. That's significant, whatever you think about his particular decisions and choices. And of those, they're a mixture. So I, I wouldn't, I mean, I was always harshly critical. You look at what I wrote back yeah, in the I 60s, I, it was I critical. Know. Nevertheless, there's, there's a strain which was on the right track. So in the mid-1970s, uh, Arafat did recognize that the settlement would have to be a two-state political settlement. Uh, there was a Security Council uh, 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 resolution debated in uh, January 1976, which was supported by the PLO. They publicly supported it, which called for a two-state settlement on the international border with full recognition of um, Israel's rights to peace and security and so on and so forth. Uh, that was a good resolution. Unfortunately, the U.S. vetoed it. Uh, that and then there was a process for a number of years in which Arafat, in his complicated way, of which there's much to criticize, nevertheless, one theme that ran through it was trying to press for such a settlement. Uh, it, the reason Israel invaded Lebanon in 1982 was to try to prevent these, this, these efforts at diplomacy to continue. In fact, they said so publicly. The, uh, it was an invasion to secure the, the West the, Bank. The invasion of Lebanon. Yeah, which it, is it, where the Palestine right, PLO right, was right, sort right, of based. Exactly. Right. And they wanted to destroy the... the it, it was called, and by the high command, in fact, a war for the West Bank. We have to stop the negotiations which and the diplomacy, which was becoming an embarrassment. And uh, let's get back to terror. They're happier with that. Uh, and this continued for some years, and it's a sort of a mixture of corruption, uh, terror, violence, uh, bad judgment, and uh, a continuing drive towards what has to be what almost the entire world recognized must be uh, some kind of political settlement along the roughly along the international border with two states side roughly by side. Roughly along the 63 borders. 67 oh, borders. 67 borders. Roughly yeah. with some modifications. Yeah. How do you... Actually, I should add, and we should be willing to recognize this, the main reason this has not taken place is that the U.S. has blocked it for 30 years how unilaterally. Is, how so? Well, as I said, it vetoed the 1976 resolution. Right. It vetoed another Security Council resolution in 1980. It has At the behest of the Israelis or independently? No. Well, you know, we could argue about exactly why, right. but uh, they did it. Uh, Israel didn't like it, but they could never have blocked it if the U.S. hadn't backed it. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, much more importantly, the U.S. provided the means, the diplomatic, uh, military, and uh, economic support, which enabled Israel to continue slowly integrating the territories effectively within Israel, the big settlement right. programs, the infrastructure programs. And they can't do it without U.S. support, and that's true right this minute. They could not? They can't do it without U.S. support, and they know it. U.S. support in terms of, uh, in, in the international community, or U.S. support at, at the U.N., for at example? every level. In other words, you're suggesting that without the U.S., uh, the, the overlooming looming possible veto at the Security Council or in some other way, that there would be some kind of what? Well, they would be blocked. There's some kind of they need the economic some support. kind of Arab reaction militarily no, no. without the U.S. I, they can't stand. Like, no small country can stand alone against a unified international community. It, it's just impossible. There are all kinds of ways yes. of stopping them, and they need the economic support and the military support. That's a nice segue to Iraq, but I want to come back yeah. to other things. Well, you know, and Israel has been has become actually it goes back before 1976. Uh, the in 1971. That's where the real split between the United States and the world begins on this. In 1971, the president of Egypt, newly new president of Egypt, the president Sadat, uh, offered Israel a full peace treaty in return for withdrawal from Egyptian territory. Uh, said nothing about the West Bank, uh, nothing about the Palestinians. A full peace treaty recognizing, incorporating the main UN resolution, 242, so right. the right to live in peace and security, and so on and so forth. Right. Everything. Uh, 
nothing about the refugees, just in return for withdrawal from Egyptian territory. Israel discussed it. They knew that it was a possible, we have internal records and others. Actually, Yossi Balin wrote a, right. his doctoral dissertation was uh, in Hebrew about revealing a lot of the records and cabinet records and other discussions about this. But it was also in the public record. Now, they dis had discussed the question, should they accept it? Now, they had a choice, and it was a fateful choice. The choice was to accept peace with Egypt. It's the main military force which would essentially end the military conflict. There were no other major Arab military forces. So accept peace with Egypt, uh, have a, still retain control of the occupied territories, have to do something about it. Because it wasn't uh, on the table. It wasn't on the table. Uh, uh, and integrate themselves somehow into the region. That was one choice. The other choice was to insist on expansion. And the crucial expansion at that time was not the West Bank. It was northeastern Sinai, Egyptian territory. They wanted to expand into northeastern Sinai, and there were big developments there driving Bedouins out of their homes. And they were building a city, in fact, an old Jewish city in northeastern Sinai. Uh, that was a choice. That, if they made the second choice, as they did, that entailed dependency on the United States because there was going to be a situation of permanent conflict. And that was the choice that was made. I think it was a very bad mistake. But my impression was, in, and I'm, again, my impression was that, that in fact, when we, we had the agreement between Egypt... 1978. Yeah, well, seven see, years later. Essentially, kind of the agreement was that, that, that no, the Israelis withdrew, and, the, no, and, see, then, and, and in fact, Arrow Sharon came in and cleaned up the settlements. Well, no, that, in, in northeastern Sinai. Right. Yeah, but am, see, am I right about that or wrong? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. The, uh, uh, but that's only half the story. Uh, by 1977, uh, what, the, what, what happened in 71 is the offer was made, Israel rejected it. The crucial question is what would the United States do? Well, there was an internal debate in the United States and it was won by Henry Kissinger, uh, whose view was, uh, as he described it, that we should keep to what he called stalemate, meaning no negotiations, just so force. Kissinger was opposed to an agreement in 1971 between right. Egypt and Israel, yes, in which would have led to the withdrawal from the Sinai. Exactly. Egypt would once again now, the reason have the Sinai and there'd be a real, uh, diplomatic relationship between the two countries. Yes, uh, and that decided the matter. Uh, the, this, which, you know, the way the U.S. goes sort of determines what happens. It's just okay. overwhelmingly powerful. Now, when that led to a war, uh, Sadat kept... 73. Yes. He kept saying, look, if you don't withdraw from the Sinai, there's going to be a war. Nobody believed him. Uh, nobody took it seriously. When the war, it, war did come in 73, and it was a huge shock. It was a close thing for Israel. Right. After the yeah. U.S. ended up with well, a nuclear uh, alert. Exactly. All right, at that point, Kissinger recognized that you can't, that Egypt isn't a basket case. You can't just dismiss it. Then he began his shuttle diplomacy, and it goes on up to Camp David, finally, 78, right. 79. And at that point, Sadat, uh, it, it, the U.S. and Israel agreed to an offer that Sadat had presented in 1971, but the new one was harsher from the point of view of Israel and the United States than the original one. It would have been better off if they accepted 71 well, rather than the one that was negotiated. Better off from their point of view, which Carter, I don't accept. By Jimmy Carter, Camp yes, David. But, and but, so. See, but in 71, uh, there was nothing about the Palestinians. By 1977, the Palestinian issue was on the table. Uh, and uh, the U.S. and Israel had to accept an order, an offer which uh, recognized in some fashion Palestinian national rights, which they didn't want to do. I mean, I think they should have done it, so I can't say it's worse, but they didn't want it. Now, it's interesting that this is described in the United States as a uh, diplomatic triumph. In fact, it was a diplomatic catastrophe. If it had been accepted in 1971, would have spared well, the, I, I, the I would, Jimmy Carter was here several days ago. I mean, he certainly thought it was a diplomatic triumph. He probably doesn't know the history. I mean, you should have asked him whether he knows what happened in the background. Well, if I'd had this interview before, yeah. I would have. Well, it's all on the public record. Yeah. You know, well, so, but I mean... But, uh, but, you know, this is one of the many things we have to learn about and if, if we want to, make, to gain some understanding of what's really happening there. So when you ask questions about, say, Arafat, you know, unfortunately, all of this has to come in. Okay, fair enough. Uh, but what's interesting now, let me, let me make this point. I spoke to someone... Uh, about you today, and he said the following to me. 
someone who many his views you would recommend, you would, would agree with, some not. Uh, he said to me that after complimenting your mind, the quality of the mind and, and um, contributions you had made, he said that what you had done is turned American exceptionalism on its back. And that you're, for all those who believed in American exceptionalism, you had believed in exactly the opposite, whatever that is. And let me stay with this question. On the other hand, there are people who have asked you, look, if you have such strong feelings about how wrong-headed American policy has been, why don't you leave the country a frequent sort of thing that's thrown at people yes. who are critical frequently. And you always say, I love this country. Yeah, well, surely. Right. I mean, it's a very interesting question. I mean, let's, let's try it on some other country. You know, it's sometimes easier to think about things clearly if we sure. distance yeah, ourselves. Great, great. Well, let's go back to, say, our the big enemy, Soviet Union. Right. I mean, the Russians would have been delighted to have uh, the dissidents leave the country. If Sakharov had been willing to come to the no. West, they would have applauded. What, does it make sense to tell, ask Sakharov, why don't you leave it, the Soviet Union? I mean, I no, I'm not trying to ask that. You understand, I'm not asking that question. But I'm see, actually using the, that question the to make the point that you've always that's said. That's the framework in which the, country, the question should be understood. Right. It's assuming that you can't have a democratic society. You stay society. and fight for values because you love the country. And you, that think, that you, think, said, that the, you think that the country ought to live up to these values. And there are, you know, you can't rank countries uh, A, B, C, D. Countries have all sorts of properties. There's a culture, there's a society, there's modes of interaction, and so on. A lot of the things that are, uh, are simply achievements. I mean, take, say, protection of free speech. Right. It's unique in the United States. There are a lot of great things that have been achieved. There are a lot of rotten things that have been done. If you con or if you have any concern about the country, meaning its people, its culture, and so on, you want to save and extend and amplify the achievements and modify the And, and you uh, would put crimes. the protection of free speech high up on that list. Of, Very high. And it's not the only one. Okay, but well, tell me more, and then we'll come to some of the criticisms cause, uh, that you have made about American imperialism and the like. See, that's, see, we have to make a distinction between state power and a country. The different things. I, I understand the difference. Uh, but, and, but, but it's often not distinguished. If you criticize state policy, you're not criticizing a country. I understand that too. I mean, we, we first and frequently when you're traveling around the world, as I do, you know, people say, "I love, you know, America." Oh, yeah. I'm just having I hate a great, the policy. I hate the policy. And sure. If, and it's we're responsible for the policy. It's a free country. We can't say, you know, I don't have any responsibility for the policy because we do. We may not know about it, but then we should find out about it. And if we decide we don't like it, we should change it. In fact, take a look at the question we've just been discussing: two-state settlement. Right. About two-thirds of the American population supports the international consensus on this and long Which has. is they ought to be a two-state solution. Uh, roughly the 67 right. borders. Right. And it's, it's kind of interesting to look at the polls. I mean, polls will, you, you find roughly two-thirds of the population saying, yeah, they support that. And roughly the same proportion says the U.S. ought to become more involved in the diplomacy. People don't know that that's a contradiction. The reason that that policy has, that program has not been achieved is because of consistent U.S. intervention to prevent it from being achieved. And that continues at this very moment, in fact. Okay, it is a free country. We've got a lot of freedom. That means we have people have the opportunity to discover its work. You know, it's not going to come easily. It's where the Internet is helpful but, but, to have the opportunity to discover the relevant facts and background which should show them that their position is contradictory. They must come to understand what the U.S. government role has been over the years in preventing the outcome that they want. Okay. Do you believe, do you in the end then, if in fact, accept the premise that people get, for the most part in a democracy, people get the government they deserve? No, I don't. You don't? No, in you fact. Don't, uh, and you, because not you believe, well, let me finish. Because you believe the political process is corrupt. It's not and corrupt. It's, it's, it's what? See, whenever anybody says, look to me, I know yeah. they're saying I mean, it's he not, doesn't it's not, get... It's not that simple. Right. I mean, it, it's not that there's robbery and stealing of elections. There is a distribution of power internal to the country, enormous disparity of economic and other power, and that influences everything that happens in dramatic ways. So many issues simply don't come up in elections. So the haves have more power than the have-nots, and therefore they're able to I mean, exercise it. In fact, it if you really look closely... Uh, elections, uh, they restrict themselves to issues uh, on which 
the population, they eliminate issues where the mass of the population opposes elite opinion systematically. And the population is aware of Say this. Say that again, I'm sorry. Well, uh, let's take a concrete case, right. okay? The year 2000 election, see? Uh, among the issues that were highest in concern to the general population are things that roughly relate to the so-called trade agreements. So uh, uh, deficits, uh, 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 overseas investment, the uh, transfer of jobs, you know, lots of topics like that. Did the, the, right at that time, uh, there was a plan for a, uh, uh, an international hemispheric conference uh, at Quebec, hemispheric summit, a few months later, which was intended to extend the NAFTA type agreement to the whole hemisphere. Now, that's a, these are issues of enormous concern to right. people. Did it come up in the election? No. And there's a reason why it didn't come up in the election, and it's consistent. On those issues, the public tends to oppose uh, policies on which there is an elite consensus, and therefore it doesn't come up in elections. Well, that's okay, part uh, of the but, reflection. But, but I mean, let me just make sure I understand, how do you stand yourself on the NAFTA agreement? Uh, I agree with the general population. I think... Uh, if you, you agree got, with the general population whose view is? Critical. Critical. And correct. Because? Because it's the wrong agreement. Uh, if you go back to 1990, 10 years ago, when the NAFTA agreement was coming along, uh, there were serious critical analyses of it, uh, which were in favor of a North American free trade agreement, but not this one. Uh, the analyses came from the labor movement. They came from Congress's research bureau, the Office of Technology Assessment. Pretty much the same analyses said, yeah, a North, agreement, uh, a North American economic agreement would be a good idea, but this one is designed and as effectively an investor rights agreement. It privileges rights of investors and uh, mm. lenders, and, but it, and it marginalizes the rights of people. And, and were you worried? And were you worried about the laws of jobs and those kinds of issues that became a political football? And, and, well, and that, the, the that, unions essentially were opposed to it. That's the story, but it's not true. Oh, not the, true. In other words, you're saying that then they they misled us when they made that argument. No, the unions did not make. They the never argument. made an argument that we were opposed because they, of jobs. They mentioned that, but the labor movement had an official position. It was produced by the Labor Advisory Council along detailed analysis, and it was a very sensible position. It was never given, it never entered the media discussion. It was never given any publicity. The labor, market, the labor movement was accused of uh, crude uh, nationalism, this, that, and the other thing. That was not their position. Their actual position never made it to the public agenda. And, and, and the and same is true of Congress's own research bureau which had a rather similar analysis. Yes, in favor of a NAFTA-style agreement, but not that one. It's kind of interesting that a few days ago, the Carnegie Endowment released an analysis of NAFTA, uh, say a fairly critical analysis. It was reported in the press, making some proposals as to how it should have been done. And those proposals, though they didn't say so, happened to be very similar to those that were proposed by the labor movement and Congress's yeah. research bureau 10 years ago, but didn't enter the political discussion, was not in, mentioned in the media, for example. Well, this is only one example of which there are numerous uh, ones. Ba in which basically saying that what you're arguing is that people are not getting the information they need to make wise choices. They aren't, nor in fact are they given the choice. They aren't given the choice. The choice between who, are, who are the two parties nominated in an election. No, that they have, but the two parties represent essentially the same concentration of interests. Look, concentration United, of economic power. Look, the United States is essentially a one-party state. It has two factions of the business party. In fact, one of the leading, uh, one of the leading uh, uh, political science analyses of uh, the nature of the U.S. party system by a fine political scientist at the University of Massachusetts, Tom Ferguson, uh, is what he calls the investment theory of okay, politics. But, but let me, Investors get together to invest to control okay, the Okay, well, state. let me ask you this. Let's take two or three countries where you and I know, okay? Yeah. We have two parties in the United Kingdom, right? Mm -hmm. We have the Tory party and the Labour party. Is, would you say the same thing about them? To Essentially? A, it depends when. Today, uh, by, today, well, today. by today, it's Today it's close to true. Okay, in, Fran in much France you yeah. have you have a socialist party and a you know the Chirac Gaullist party, uh, essentially the same. I mean, they're, they're well, not a, they're not a whole lot of differences there. I mean, they have thirty five hour week. In Spain, in Spain we no. have socialist party, yeah. 
know? Well, I, see, I would suggest we take. Is any different in any of those countries in terms of how much difference there is between the, the two there parties? Are, because let me there make this argument. Let me make this argument with you and, and just get the. Essentially, in most countries, the battle in politics is for the center, is it not? In most places. No. Now, that doesn't That's mean that. True. That's simply not true. I mean, there are countries that have a much more lively democratic culture. Uh, so let's take a country that has a really lively democratic culture, much more than we do. Like? Brazil. Okay. Uh, Brazil is a rich, potentially rich, important country. Yeah. Uh, in Brazil, uh, something just happened recently uh, which should humiliate us. They give us a real lesson in democracy. In Brazil, uh, popular movements large-scale popular movements, which had been developing over 20 years, reached a scale where they were able to elect a populist president over the opposition of highly concentrated capital and media concentration. Okay. We I, can't I, even dream of okay. that. Well, That's a functioning democratic culture. Uh, but let, me, let me stop you for a second. Let me just get a couple of questions in. Number one, is, I asked that question recently of Gary Wills was here. You know, why haven't we seen in the United States more success by a powerful coalition, uh, essentially coming from the left, uh, but, but not necessarily defined by what the conception, traditional conventional wisdom might be of the left, of, of labor, minorities, poor, we have, we have black seen and it. white. We have seen it. What, what was it the last time you saw it? A number of times. We saw it, we saw it in the 60s. That's where the great society programs come from. We saw it in the 30s. That's where the New Deal comes from. And in fact, this is a battle that goes back to the origins of American history. You know, the, the original constitutional framework, the way Madison... The author of the Great Society programs was Lyndon Johnson. That's right. And he re the programs are not initiated by leaders. That's a serious misunderstanding. Well, those programs pro were initiated primarily by people who actually, many of them who had served with FDR. See, that's a serious misinterpretation, I believe, of the way the political system works. Leaders may sign their names and they may push programs, but they do it because a popular constituency is compelling them to do it. That's the way changes take place. I mean, if there's a large-scale popular movement and there are pressures, okay. there'll be somebody who'll say, I'm your leader, but, you know, I'll but sign But since it. you've made the Great and Society... And what happened in this, the programs that came out of the so-called Great Society were the result of popular ferment uh, and uh, activism and changes that were taking place, significant changes that were taking place in the 1960s, which very much democratized the society. Okay. Yep. And it led to these programs. Since then, there's been an enormous counterattack from business sectors trying to beat it back. Uh, and that's the course of history. You know, that, uh, it's the same with the civil rights movement, it was the same with the okay. labor but, movement. But, let me, let me make this point by Lynn Johnson, because a lot of other things, and, and I want to say that we, we're 42 minutes in, we're doing an hour with you, and I want to invite you back, because okay. inevitably people are going to say to me, you know, you could have gone for two or three hours, and you know, you know or they will say, you interrupted too much, or they'll say a lot of other things, and, and I do want to hear from you, and I, you know, many people, many people saw Lyndon Johnson, you know, as a man who, who had, was too beholden to economic interest. Uh, in terms of how he achieved his own wealth, and in terms of, of a whole range of things, whether it was brown root in Texas, or whether his relationship with a whole lot of institutions. But you were saying that he responded the way he did to great society programs having to do with, with medical care, having to do with poverty, having to do with a whole range of issues. He responded and to civil public rights pressures. Because the public pressure was the there. The same was true of John F. Kennedy. I'm, I'm willing to argue with you that Lyndon Johnson responded in part because that was where his heart was and his Maybe. sense of legacy in terms of what had influenced him. Yeah. You know? See, we're, we're, he, and, and secondly, he, some of the things that John Kennedy responded to, he saw his opportunity in history, in a sense, to show that he could get yeah. these things enacted because that was his principal skill. See, we're not disagreeing. We're I talking so. about different topics. Okay. Let me move. The topic that you're talking about is individual personalities. So the individual personality, Lyndon Johnson, what was going on in his mind. The topic that I'm talking about is how popular movements develop, create their own programs, yeah. press for them, finally often get somebody yeah. to initiate them. Those are different questions. Okay, and I may, yeah. I, may just, I may agree with you, actually. I mean, I look with great interest in what's happening in Brazil. Yeah. And, the, and, and here. I, it's happened here. That's, that's why, why do we have freedom of speech? I mean, freedom of speech is not in the Constitution. It's not in the Bill of Rights. In fact, up until the 19th, it's not. Up until the 1960s, in fact, the, the legal battles about freedom of speech are mostly in the 20th century.
and there was no real legal protection for substantial freedom of speech, actually, until the 60s. In the 1960s, the Supreme Court finally, uh, first in the course of the Civil Rights Movement, then later in the decade, okay. finally realized a level of legal protection of freedom of speech that, to my knowledge, doesn't exist in any other country. And it's a large part of it grew out of the uh, activism of the Civil just, Rights Movement. Just to understand you, because I want to go to some things that, that are often attached to you and, and bring great controversy to you. Um, other than freedom of speech, what else do you think is, is part of what America is, uh, represents? Yes. Represents. To, to, well, is, is, is. is. Good you're, about you're, American you're, life? You're, well, there's good. a lot of things I like that are, I think, great about American life. For one thing, we have, compared with other societies, there's very little in the way of a kind of a caste system. Yeah. So people are interact independently of social position. Yeah. Is uh, there wealth. a meritocracy? There is in uh, certainly in terms of policy formation. That's overwhelming. Mm -hmm. But I, we're talking in terms of personal interaction. Are you? Mm -hmm. Does it matter whether you're uh, this is your what you do or that's what you do? Yeah. Well, these interactions among people, uh, informal interactions, are in my view much healthier in the United States than okay. other societies that I know. Now, those are important facts about a culture. I Freedom agree. of speech is not just a matter of law. It's a matter of being internalized, you know, realizing, understanding, that's my right and I'm going to defend it. That's important. And the same is true of other rights. Actually, the United States has become a much more civilized society since the 1960s, just in our recent lifetime. Because, do you think? Well, because of popular activism. Let's okay. take women's rights. Was that an issue 40 years ago? No. Uh, environmental issues, did they exist 40 years ago? No. Uh, let's take something like opposition to aggression and violence. Th th that Attitudes on that have changed enormously. I mean, when John F. Kennedy attacked South Vietnam, as he did in 1962, direct attack. You mean it was the assassination of Jim or what? No. When the U.S. Air so Force first sent their supporters, see, I mean, so little there was so little opposition to this that no one even knows what happened. But if you look back at the record, the historical and documentary record, it's not controversial. Yeah. In 1962, uh, Kennedy uh, sent the U.S. Air Force to start bombing South Vietnam. Uh, they did it in South Vietnamese planes with Vietnamese markings, but it was U.S. pilots and U.S. equipment, uh, thin cover. Uh, he authorized the use of napalm. Uh, he started the crop destruction programs to uh, keep food from the indigenous rebels. Wait a minute, he started driving <laughs> no, millions wait a minute, of... But I got... Look, this is a war. Was there any protest? No. Okay, now that's changed. Well, that may, no so, may have been somebody who wasn't significant. Look, I can tell you because I was directly involved. In well, it. You, you we've could, got you to know get, you because of your you opposition to you Vietnam. You couldn't get right. four people in a room to talk about well, it. Well, I, you, it, it I was I, years. I'm not arguing about this. It was, but this is important about the country. It was four or five years before a significant a, a popular movement developed opposing an aggressive war against another country. Let's fast forward to today. Right. Uh, in this year, there were huge popular protests right. before the war was officially launched. Agreed. That's a tremendous change in consciousness. And why do you think that change took place? Because of the sixties? Because of one? Because as it breathes, it gets wider and stronger and. The, change took place because a lot of people worked very hard to make it change okay. place. The same is true of civil rights, of women's rights, of environmental issues, and oh, so on. That's the way changes happen. I want to say the same thing happened in Brazil. The but popular movements developed that way, not by some leader saying... I agree with you. I do agree with you on that. I'm not arguing that. But the interesting thing about Brazil now, you know, which is a, a worthy of a, a, a program here, and he is somebody that I'd like to... I've heard him speak and would like yeah. to see him at the table, uh, is, is he's running, he is disappointing some of his followers there because of some positions he's taking having to do with the rainforest and other issues. You know why? Why? Because there are... How come you know so much about everything? Well, check it and see if it's right. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not, not trying to persuade you <laughs> no, or anyone I know, else. No. Here's what I think, right. and I think if you investigate this, what you'll find. All right. Uh, over the last 20 or 30 years, in part as a reaction to the democratizing tendencies of the 60s, which were worldwide. Right. They were dramatic here, but also elsewhere. There's been a backlash. Part of the backlash, it's taken many forms. One of the forms it's taken is international economic arrangements, which are virtually designed to undermine democracy. 
well, these what's called in the rest of the world neoliberal arrangements. Here it's called free trade, but it's not free trade. The array of uh, international arrangements that's uh, sort of formalized in the World Trade Organization. Uh, those measures, if you look at them, are it is well understood that they undermine democracy. One of the first measures that was taken in the early 70s, initially here, but then everywhere, was to free up flow of financial capital. Right. I, uh, uh, well, you, I, I need to move on only because I got a few minutes. That's my okay, point. Well, I, just I, once, yes, I won't sir. try to explain anything, but let me just say that if you look at these arrangements, you'll find that they undermine democracy and they place countries in a stranglehold in which they cannot follow the policies of the overwhelming majority. And that's what's happening in Brazil, and that's why Lula's disappointing his okay. Uh, constituency. So, okay, fine. I'll move on. I talked to someone else, knowing that you were coming in, and they said, you know, I was, in Egypt, I was in Iraq recently, recently, and I met no Iraqi who said the war was a mistake. Lots of them in the idea of overthrowing Saddam, even now. And, and many of them wish the United States would leave. Many of them uh, have uh, are, are terribly disappointed, upset, opposed to the way things are going. But this person said, I didn't meet anyone. I, tell me how you feel about the use of American power in overthrowing Saddam. Was it because it violated your own sense of international law? Was it because that we didn't have, it wasn't a UN initiation. I'm not going to be able to answer the question because the assumptions are wrong. Okay, go ahead. Uh, the United States was not in favor of overthrowing Saddam Hussein. In fact, George Bush made that explicit. Sorry, at the Azores summit, a couple of days before the invasion started, uh, Bush and Blair uh, were there and they issued a declaration in which Bush said, even if Saddam Hussein and his family leave the country, we're going to invade anyway. And in fact, that's consistent with a long-standing U.S. policy. Uh, you're, you're right that every, I'm sure every sane person in Iraq wanted to get rid of Saddam right, Hussein, right. just like I have for right, 20 right. years, just like we all have, a murderous tyrant. Right. Why is he there? Uh, why wasn't he overthrown? Uh, or to ask another question, why do the majority of Iraqis, the lar when Iraqis are, at, we have the published polls, Iraqis are asked, who's your favorite foreign leader? The favorite foreign leader of Iraqis, according to U.S.-run polls, is President Chirac of France, who was the symbol of opposition to the invasion. George Bush is far below, uh, Blair even less below. Nevertheless, the same polls show, say, yeah, we're glad to get rid of Saddam Hussein. Well, if we want to think about this, we'll be able to figure out what's happening. Sure, they would like to get rid of Saddam Hussein. They would have liked to have gotten rid of him years ago. I mean, in 1991, they almost did get rid of him. But the U.S. supported Saddam so that he could crush the rebellion, which probably would have overthrown him. And we know why. Well, I'm not sure they supported him so that he could they crush authorized the rebellion. Him. They effectively well, authorized him to crush the rebellion. I'm not sure that, that well, many people... Well, but you got well, Let's look back Professor to... Trump, the, let's at least back, let me make one point. Yeah. Is that, I mean, it, it clearly was a mistake. What in 1991. Well, was it a mistake? It, sure it was, to allow, him to, allow him to crush the rebellion. I think it was a mistake. Yes, I do too. Did George Bush think it was a mistake? No. Uh, did Thomas Friedman of the New York Times think it was a mistake? I, don't, I no. can't speak for George did, Bush and Thomas Friedman. Well, did the New York, did, did, did the press think it was a mistake? I mean, to, just take a look back and look at the analysis. And to allow him to, take a look to have analysis. helicopters and be able to crush the... Take a look the, at the analysis. The, the analysis... The Shias and the, exactly. who George Bush let's, let's had take, asked to, who had asked to rise up? Let's take a look at the analysis at the time. That's what we should be looking at. The, you can read it in, say, the New York Times, the most important newspaper in the world. Their analysis was, Alan Cowell, their Middle East correspondent, right. uh, that much as we dislike the atrocities, there's an overwhelming consensus that uh, Saddam Hussein offers more hope for the stability of the country, stability is a kind of technical word, stability of the country than the people who are trying to overthrow him. In other words, we'd rather have him than the people who are trying to overthrow him. Thomas Friedman, well, maybe was, they were, uh, Thomas Friedman who was the diplomatic car, chief diplomatic correspondent, wrote, uh, the best possible solution for the United, the best possible world for the United States would be an iron-fisted military junta ruling Iraq the same way Saddam Hussein did 
much to the satisfaction. Well, I'm sure. Of, this I know is Mr. Friedman, and I am the, sure he did not is, mean using the torture really? and using the technique. Yes. Then why did he say it? Well, but he may very well have believed See, that, that, that was. They the, may very well. He must. He may very well. Uh, first of all, I'm I'm leery of speaking for anyone like this right. uh, of George Bush or Tom Friedman. But he may very well have meant that that Iraq, because of whatever fears he had, that it would break up the Balkanization of Iraq, whatever, and therefore it needed a okay, Tito-like let, figure. Let's say he may right. have meant that. Let's say Iraq. But then, see, that means that from the point of view of U.S. policymakers and U.S. commentators, it wasn't a mistake. I think it was a mistake. You think it was exactly. a mistake, but they didn't. Right. The the. Uh, uh, Analysts and the policymakers thought it was right. Well, they I, preferred. Yeah. So, and then let's look at the I'll next. Bet you let's the, look at I the bet next. you the neocons who you find so much fault with in there did not think it was a mistake. Well, we don't know. They well, I mean, see, the they Wolf, were they the were, Wolfowitz of the world probably do, don't really? think it was a mistake. Well, let's take a look at the Wolf not to have overthrown Saddam because oh, I mean they've been driven by overthrowing Saddam let's, since let's, 1991. You'll agree with that, won't you? No, I don't. That let's they take, haven't been driven on. by the notion. It's just too narrow a question. Let's take a look at the Wolfowitzes of the world. Okay, he has a record, right? Right. His record is, yeah. for example, strong support of General Suharto, who is exactly... When he served in Indonesia. And afterwards, up until 1997, a couple of months before Suharto was overthrown, he was still praising him. Uh, Suharto was a mass murderer, uh, probably worse than Saddam Hussein. He came into power killing a couple hundred thousand people. He ran a regime of vicious torture and oppression. He invaded East Timor, practically destroyed it. Uh, his torture and massacres were going on right to the end of his rule. Uh, Wolfowitz was praising him because of his uh, uh, contributions to the uh, growth and development of uh, Indonesia. At that Actually, time, Wolfowitz so, served as ambassador to Indonesia. This, this started when he was... Uh, in the State Department with responsibility for Asia, Southeast Asia in particular, went on, was in, he was in uh, uh, as ambassador to Indonesia, and it continued through his post-government service. Mm -hmm. I think he was uh, dean but when, of, Okay, but when, uh, that, that's, 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 when, that's only but... one example. As uh, in, under his watch as State Department uh, a uh, high official in the State Department with responsibility for Asia, the Reagan administration under his watch, supported a whole range of murderous dictators, like Chun of South Korea. I support him up to the what, end. What, what, okay, I'm, I'm not sure. So, I, I remember or, Chun, and I'm not sure when he came uh, in and what he, he didn't he, have. But he I mean, was thrown out. The whole he was series out of American by, administrations, which is your point exactly, a whole series of American administrations supported a whole series of leaders in South Korea. Absolutely, and Wolfowitz was response, was in charge, uh, almost in charge, you know, second in command, yeah. State Department, right up to the end. Marcos in uh, the Philippines is okay. another. Let me now, there are all kind of fake stories being concocted about this now, but I would urge people to go back to the original record and see what happened. All right. This book, Noam Chomsky, uh, Hegemony or Survival, America's Quest for Global Dominance. Uh, we'll talk more about all these issues Great. with him and others. I thank you for coming. Great. Pleasure to have nice you on the program. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you for joining us. We went the hour. Uh, more to be said tomorrow night. Tony Morrison is here and others. See you then. Would, your, would you like what's said about you to be your political arguments or your contribution to the theory of linguistics? I'll tell you the honest truth, I really don't care. You don't care. I mean, I'd like to see people follow up on the things that are interesting and important and productive and forget about the things that were byways and mistakes and so on. But if I, my name is attached to it or not, but what, uh, what then would you characterize as most important in your judgment if you are? Well, I mean, I played a certain role in reshaping the uh, fields concerned with uh, human intellectual faculties, cognitive sciences right. in particular, linguistics. Some of it has been extremely productive. Not me, it's cooperative enterprise. And that's often running on its own. Right. Uh, in the political domain, I'm, you know, I, I would like to see people energized, participating, thinking for themselves, uh, not subordinating themselves to systems of discipline and propaganda, either in the structure of life, and there's plenty of that, or in the uh, uh, doctrinal domains. So if people can be, can come to use the capacities that they in fact have and the opportunities they in fact have to overcome systems of authority, illegitimate authority, domination, hierarchy, free themselves, uh, 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 think through 
issues for themselves, not the way they're taught to conform and do something about it. That's the best legacy I can imagine. Yeah. As I said to you when you said that, I know nothing about linguistics. One of many subjects I know nothing about, <laughs> but especially linguistics. If there, is there one question in the air in that whole realm, though, that you would like most to know the answer to? Well, I, like everyone, I have my own personal quirk. Norm Chomsky is here. He is a political activist, he is a writer, and he is a professor at MIT. He has written exclusively and lectured around the world on linguistics, philosophy, and politics. He is widely credited with having revolutionized modern linguistics. He is the author of numerous books, including American Power and the New Mandarins, and also 9-11. Here is Hegemony or Survival, his newest book. I am pleased to have him on this program for many reasons, including the fact that I get more emails about please have Mr. Chomsky <laughs> on this program than anyone can ever imagine. Um, how do you explain this phenomenal connection between you and certainly an audience of people who are user-friendly with the Internet? It well, I think uh, people who are, there's an enormous number of people who are involved in an informal, disorganized, uh, activist, dissident culture and they tend to make their own connections outside the major institutional channels which right. are not, not hospitable to them and the internet has been uh, has become a major form of uh, interconnection organizing uh, uh, not just in the united states uh, sure. everywhere i mean in south korea for example they recently uh, elected a president uh, using the internet for organizing and communication and getting around the strong opposition of the media and the concentrated power to the popular candidates. Well, it happens we, to be a very wired up society. Oh, it is. Broadband, uh, I think, has a higher yeah. penetration in South Korea, yeah. perhaps more than any other country except Singapore. But it's happened everywhere. I mean, let's take, say, Indonesia. Yeah. When the Suharto dictatorship was overthrown in 1998, uh, a lot of the organizing, a lot of it was student activism, and they it was a very harsh, brutal society, but they did succeed through internet interconnections to uh, organize political actions, demonstrations, uh, uh, other activities, and it was a major factor leading to, leading to the overthrow of the dictatorship. Well, Howard Dean, I suspect, would say that one of the primary reasons he had been able to get to this commanding position in the Democratic race for the presidency is, is the Internet, allowing him both to communicate and to raise money. Yeah. It's had, I mean, it's a sort of a, can also be a lethal instrument, but... Uh, lethal in what way? Well, I'm sure you get, I don't don't want to guess how many emails you get, but <laughs> no, it, you can be, yeah, it can be uh, overwhelming. <laughs> Even uh, a lot of material that, uh, that one of the problems with the internet, I mean, it's, it's the good part of it is it's free and open. Right, exactly. But of course, that has a downside. That means that things go up that uh, have no uh, review and they, or uh, you know support. And, you they clog the, and they clog the system. They clog the system, and yeah. so it's a mixture. But it's it certainly has been an extremely effective way of uh, allowing people to participate uh, actively in in even in in everything from industrial societies to very repressive societies. Uh, so let's take say the World Social Forum, which is a huge uh, enterprise, hundred hundred thousand people last year. It's mostly internet organized. There's just no other means yeah. of, inter of intercommunication among highly diverse people. Most of them are somewhat, you know, out of the power centers in their own societies, and this provides yeah. them a means of uh, organizing, exchanging information, uh, interaction that gives them access to a far wider range of uh, um, sources of information and analysis than they would get by, you know, picking up the newspapers mm -hmm. at the newsstand, and that has major effect. Do you think regimes around the world ought to be frightened of the possibilities of the Internet? I'm sure they are, including our own government. Uh, since the uh, the Internet was, like most modern technology, it came out of the state system. Right. We have a very, a lot of the economy relies on a dynamic state sector. The Internet was right. developed... Uh, In the Pentagon or somewhere. Well, it was 
you know, actually places like MIT, right. but it came, yes, it came out of Pentagon funding in uh, advan the Advanced Research Project Agency, the Pentagon, about in the early 60s. Right. And it remained inside the state system until the mid-90s. I think 1995 it was privatized. And since then, it's changed. I mean, it, 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 before that, it was considered, it would, in fact, it was called usually an information highway. Uh, after that, it's mm -hmm. mostly called uh, e-commerce, right. uh, and the character of it changed. But there has been a lot of concern in power centers all over the world that it's just too free and open. And the question is, how can you shape it and modify it so as to lead people in preferred directions, you know, away from, say, organizing the World now, Social what, Forum? For, for, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But what, for example, are the Chinese doing about it? Do you know? In China, I think internet access is quite restricted That's what I thought. and highly censored. Hmm. Uh, I don't know how much even limited access there is, but it's a very hard medium to control. Exactly. You know, once people have access, they can do all sorts of things. So the the means of controlling it I, that are being considered, as far as I understand, uh, are mostly uh, trying to lead people in particular directions. So that you, when you mm -hmm. enter an internet portal, you know you'll be sort of drawn right, off right, this right, way, drawn here rather that way, okay. yeah. right, rather and than, therefore you'll have the rather ideas, than opening up, it'll yeah. take you somewhere. And the the idea is you'll have to use you know energy and initiative and commitment and what you're looking for if you want to go in the in the directions less preferred by power centers, which is it's mm -hmm. a terrain of struggle right now. There's a lot of pressure from popular and activist yeah. groups to make it, leave it entirely open, not controlled. If you were, if this would be your last day on Earth. <laughs> not that far from it. Well, you're, what, 75? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, would, no, and yes, there are some questions which are... big mega question? That's there are mega questions which uh, are on the border of research. You can't really... They're a little beyond what you can study very much. You can pick, pick away at them. But uh, well, one kind of question, which is a sort of a personal obsession, uh, is that uh, if you look at any uh, language as a biological system, right. it's part of our, it's like our immune system right. or visual system, just something humans have. It's highly specific to humans. There don't seem to be any counterparts elsewhere in nature. You're, you're in New York because of our mutual friend, Edward Said, who passed away. Uh, several a month or so ago, correct? Yeah, and you tell me what. Tell me just because you're here, your sense of what would you most want to say in appreciation of him? Well, Edward was an old friend. We were very close friends for years. We um, had a lot of mutual interests. Uh, uh, we've uh, would that be culture, music, politics? culture, politics mainly, mainly political interests, mm. uh, including his prime concern, also a major concern of mine, Middle East, but right. much broader questions of uh, justice, uh, freedom, mm. uh, oppression, uh, which he was much involved in, me too, and our paths often crossed, and then it was just a close personal friendship. Actually, he had arranged, uh, we've never talked about this much, but back in the uh, I guess it must have been around 20 years ago or 25 years ago, he began arranging with uh, meetings between uh, high officials in the Palestine Liberation Organization when they were visiting New York, uh, meetings with uh, friends of his who were uh, sympathetic to the Palestinians, critical of the PLO, to see if there could be some constructive discussion to suggest ways in which they could change what they're doing to achieve